The month of Ramadan marked by Muslims across the world with fasting has begun. In Gaza, the month commences amidst concerns over a looming famine. UN agencies have time and again warned of the impact of hunger on people, especially children. We already have reports of children dying due to hunger and the number of that is likely to increase. The situation has been made worse by Israel's active blocking of aid trucks. We go to Abdul for more details. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. As Ramadan begins, a very difficult situation in Gaza. There's, of course, the question of the attacks, the continuous attacks that take place. But the hunger situation is what is on the minds of a lot of people. Could you talk a bit about that first? Well, Prashant, uh, the hunger situation has been highlighted by United Nations agencies, several of them, of course, in the last uh, few months at least, uh, but particularly pointing out how the humanitarian aid, which should have increased in the uh, as per the uh, International Court of Justice instructions, as per the Israel's its own commitments Israel has made, as per the U.S. claims and so on and so forth, as per the United Nations Security Council resolutions. All those international uh, moves basically assure increased humanitarian aid. But on the ground, none of those assurances have uh, been uh, taken a concrete shape. And what has happened that humanitarian aid, particularly food, has gone, uh, and the availability of it has gone down tremendously. All the uh, attempts to kind of portray that some of the countries are airdropping food and other essential commodities have also not helped. Uh, in kind of improving the situation. And, and that basically is reflected in the number of kids, Palestinian uh, children dying of hunger has increased to 25 as per the latest count. And uh, if you include all the people who have died because of the reported starvation, uh, that number uh, has increased to 28. And as per the UN agency's claim, international, uh, sorry, uh, World Food Program and other people, uh, other groups have claimed that out of uh, uh, every uh, six children inside uh, Gaza, at least uh, uh, one of them is basically in a very uh, basically uh, uh, on the verge of fair mind. So it shows that the overall situation uh, when it comes to humanitarian uh, condition, availability of food, particularly at the time uh, of Ramadan, as you rightly pointed out, is uh, kind of has uh, in a very uh, critical situation. And that basically uh, questions the overall uh, 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 commitment, which several agencies and the, uh, the United Nations as the, and the U.S. has basically uh, talking about. So uh, overall situation in terms of humanitarian uh, aid, in, in terms of food, in terms of other essential commodity is basically every day becoming bad to worse. And it is, uh, as agencies were saying, any day, any minute, famine will be a reality. This is already the numbers are increasing uh, and reports are coming from all over Gaza. And this is going to be beyond uh, anybody's control if this uh, condition uh, uh, continues the way it is at this moment. Yeah, the key point also, I guess, is that Israel has been deliberately blocking aid. Could you maybe talk a bit about that and also how the international community, so to speak, is responding to the situation? Well, Prashant, ever since uh, International Court of Justice asked specifically that there should be increased access to humanitarian aid uh, to the uh, to Palestinians in Gaza. If, from that moment onward, instead of com uh, kind of uh, increasing the availability of humanitarian aid, what Israel has done, that has it has bureaucratized whatever process was available before for the reach uh, uh, for the humanitarian aid. Earlier, there were around 200 trucks uh, reaching on a uh, daily basis, on an average, to Gaza from different uh, crossing, particularly Rafah crossing. Uh, but the number of trucks going to uh, uh, Gaza has come down almost less than 100, uh, as per the uh, latest uh, comments, claims made by the uh, uh, UNRWA and other agencies uh, uh, in working in, uh, in Gaza. And, and that has primarily happened because, as I said, bureaucratization, uh, Israel has imposed different barriers, uh, uh, multiple checks for the trucks have been introduced. Uh, some of the uh, borders which were uh, uh, gate, which basically uh, supplies the aid to Gaza has been blocked. 
some of the uh, uh, trucks which basically were uh, about uh, to reach Gaza were looted by uh, there are reports from the extremist uh, settlers uh, from uh, from Israel. There are reports also that uh, uh, Israel has basically uh, uh, kind of denied permission to some of the agencies to kind of uh, uh, basically uh, carry uh, uh, the delivery of aid uh, while uh, uh, while introducing one mechanism or another. And uh, because the war continues inside Gaza, even if whatever aid is reaching to the territory, it is difficult to distribute them uh, to different parts of Gaza because of the bombings and because of the ground offensive, because of the roadblocks uh, created by the Israeli forces at different points. Uh, so. Uh, uh, also, of course, uh, uh, when we talk about the nature of the humanitarian aid, of course, uh, as I said, the food gra availability of food items is uh, uh, precarious. But at the same time, the fuel, which basically which makes it possible to distribute uh, the food into different parts of Gaza through uh, vehicles and all, that is also uh, not that is also not available adequately. So all of this combined, basically. And all of this, of course, because of the Israeli war, uh, has kind of led to a very bad situation in terms of the availability of uh, all basic commodities, but particularly the food uh, inside Gaza. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for that update. The latest round of negotiations on the controversial pandemic treaty is concluded, even as another round is set to begin in about a week. The upcoming discussions will be the final round before the text is discussed at the World Health Assembly in May. Now, as regular viewers of this show would know, the pandemic treaty is supposed to be a response from our lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic. Its aim is to prepare humanity for further pandemics in the future, maybe. However, from the very beginning, critics have said it does not address many concerns raised by countries of the Global South. So, did the latest round of discussions manage to do that? What is in the new draft? We go to Jolts now for the details. Joshna, thanks so much for joining us. So, discussions on the pandemic treaty, at least one round of discussions uh, having come to an end. Another round, I think, coming up soon before it comes up for discussion finally uh, in May. So, what were the highlights of this round of discussions? Yeah. Uh, hi, Prashant. So, um, the, most importantly, the uh, latest text of the pandemic treaty, which will be discussed from uh, March 18th to 28th, uh, came out on Friday. And it is for the first time that uh, the uh, negotiations will be text-based negotiations. So just to explain briefly, uh, usually when in the World Health Organizations an important uh, accord or treaty like this is being discussed, usually uh, the, uh, the Secretariat or the Bureau for uh, the negotiations, they prepare a text and countries come and they specify things that they don't like or they want uh, additions or deletions and improvements, etc. Um, and that starts after a couple of uh, negotiating meetings uh, already, which have happened. But in this particular case, eight rounds of negotiations have already happened. And uh, there has been no text-based negotiations so far. So it is for the first time in the ninth round of the meeting that we will actually have the text-based negotiations. So what has happened so far is... Uh, asking the countries to actually talk at the level of uh, concepts and uh, not uh, uh, talking about a specific uh, uh, clauses. Uh, so it will be interesting to see what kind of additions and deletions we will be seeing in the text uh, during those 10 days. But also to mention, this is only the penultimate uh, uh, round of negotiations because the idea is by the time it is World Health Assembly in the month of May, the the text which is going to be accepted should be ready um, so so uh, uh, like countries have been pushed to uh, really negotiate uh, and uh, ask about their real demands only uh, in a very very limited period so that is the thing now talking about the text itself um, it there is a feeling that it does not really reflect the concerns of developing countries so much uh, that have been raised from the very beginning uh, when the negotiations started two years ago. Uh, there are some improvements from the initial text, uh, though, uh, which I can talk about. Uh, for example, uh, regarding intellectual property clauses, there were, uh, it was very, very diluted. There were um, as if the intellectual property barriers are the norm to go about. But we are seeing uh, some language which makes it compulsory or mandatory on the parties uh, to share, uh, uh, to 
uh, limit the intellectual property barriers. But there also there is one major uh, issue which we faced a lot during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which is uh, the, the parties, especially the big pharmaceutical companies, it will boil down to that, are not really, uh, it is not mandatory for them to share the know-how of making the drugs, etc. Till you do not have this, the other forms of um, um, uh, better clauses uh, become uh, null and void almost because till you do not share, uh, uh, do not have technology transfer, etc. It doesn't help. So, so the but uh, the language is slightly better. Uh, that is one thing, and there are a couple of uh, other clauses in which uh, use similar things, but. Uh, uh, if you see the two major concerns, which in our show also we have talked about before, where the developed countries are not letting go of their demands and not accepting what developing countries have said. And unfortunately, it seems that the WHO Secretariat um, uh, and the Bureau, which prepared the text, have succumbed to the, uh, what developed countries want, is access and benefit sharing. There is a lot of focus. There is a very strong language uh, which uh, will ask the countries uh, and uh, mostly developing countries to share information about emerging pathogens and pathogens which can be of concern uh, to stop the pandemic from uh, a, a pandem pandemic like situation happening. I mean, sharing that so that uh, from beforehand the medical tools can be prepared. They're also supposed to contain uh, any disease, spread of disease at the local level. Um, and again, in developing countries, it will have a lot of impact. But there is no obligation to ensure that the kind of loss, livelihood loss and economic loss that the country will face because of this prevention, how will that be mitigated? What will the international community do about that? Because it is a very big responsibility to put. Um, so surveillance of pathogens and it actually uh, the kind of surveillance which is being expected has not been seen before. Uh, because there have been those mechanisms. There is monitoring that happens, but this is a different level of monitoring. So that has been made obligatory. But on the other hand, once after using this information, the, uh, after seeing the genetic material, which, which the countries are supposed to put in the public domain, by the way, um, how will the countries benefit in terms of or share the benefits uh, 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 that pharmaceutical companies will be able to make by actually producing vaccines and medicines after taking this information? Now, that reverse in terms of getting benefited after sharing this information does not exist. It is absolutely voluntary. Or, so this is a major issue. This, is, this re leads to a, another level of inequality rather than equality which the preamble of the pandemic treaty talks about so that's one the other is financing uh, there is uh, no mechanism for sustainable financing that has been charted out mm, there is some language but it says uh, it talks about a financial pool that has to be created but again it does not put any obligation on the developed countries to put the money in that pool now where will the money come from and we do and it also goes against the entire idea of common but differentiated responsibilities where the people with the kind of capacities that country have the pool in developed countries will should be pooling in more money and we have uh, References from before, uh, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, that does talk about it, where uh, the uh, developed countries are supposed to put in more money for the developing countries to use. So we are not seeing any of that. And I believe if these two things are not fixed, then we will be very close to seeing the same de uh, devastation as we saw during COVID. Because um, I can share all the information, but if I do not get the vaccines, I need uh, my livelihood and everything is gone. Um, and there is no support financially also because that mechanism is also in problem. Um, so yeah, that is where we are. Let's see what happens from 18 to 28th. Uh, the, on these issues, the developing countries have talked about before. Um, I would say we just hope that uh, if these issues are not solved, uh, then the text should not come in place. It is better to not have a text than a bad text, which will lead to similar problems that we faced earlier. Right, but also what is the scope for developing countries to push back both in the coming round as well as the discussions at the World Health Assembly where I presume once again these might come up? Um, yes, I mean, in, uh, 
I mean, they, they, there you have positive signs in terms of solidarity of the uh, countries. In fact, uh, uh, on the second last uh, uh, or last day of the eighth round, which just finished uh, on 1st of March, we actually saw that the uh, developing countries, they walked out of the negotiations because they were not being heard and they realized they are. Um, so the meeting was suspended for a few hours and then they came back and started these discussions again. Um, so the, the solidarity, if it is maintained, and uh, African group is leading these negotiations really well. Um, uh, and they are saying that uh, we will stand by our demands and we won't give in, at least as far as uh, the access and benefit sharing uh, proposal is concerned. So uh, if they go forward with this solidarity and not allow uh, uh, this text to continue the way it is, uh, then we do have hopes. Um, but uh, so far what we see, and, and that is why certain provisions in intellectual property, uh, uh, there is there are better clauses, uh, things which were voluntary, some have been made obligatory and mandatory. Right. So there have been certain. So if they stick together, we hope to have a better text. Uh, and that's the only hope at the moment. So much, Joseph, for that update. And that's all we have in this Daily Deep Brief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.